All right, so this is lecture 21, and it's the first of our legacy lectures. Um, our lecturer is Professor Bruce Blumberg from the University of California at Irvine. Um, I regard Bruce as an absolute hero, hero of the chemical dimension of sustainability. He's for decades carried out exceptionally creative and rigorous science, where the large part of his work that is of the most interest to us today arises from his discovery that certain anthropogenic chemicals, man-made chemicals, can direct stem cells to become fat cells. Dr. Blumberg named these chemicals obesogens, and in 2018, with Kristen Loberg, wrote a book called The Obesogen Effect, which you can buy um, or listen to. You can get it in audio form at, at Amazon. Uh, it's really a wonderful, wonderful scientific book, and I recommend it to you very highly. The discovery of the obesogen effect is a massively significant breakthrough in science because it resets the relationship between commercial chemicals and a multitude of metabolic disorders. I, I'm sure, um, as you'll comprehend, America is today, and it's true of a lot of other countries, by the way, but America is today a lot fatter than it used to be. And we have, have ascribed this to the couch potato syndrome. Uh, but however, it turns out that a whole range of chemicals if you're intaking them, and sometimes they're deliberately in your food, um, cause uh, signals to occur that go and tell a uh, cell to become a fat cell where that would not happen in the, the absence of that stimulation. And no doubt you'll hear a great deal about that from Dr. Blumberg today. So he's a professor in three departments, Partners of Development on Cell Biology, Pharmaceutical Sciences, and biomedical engineering. And really this is iconic of the multidisciplinary character that's essential to leading research and developing sustainable chemical products and processes. This is a critical voice for building a sustainable chemical enterprise for many reasons, including that the creativity and rigor of his endocrine disruption work stands in too often dramatic contrast with shallow and even deliberately corrupted work on identifying endocrine disruptors that pervades much of reg regulatory science in the USA today. This is a very sad thing to say and to say very publicly, but it is absolutely true. Uh, um, our regulatory agencies are letting us down and they've been oppressed in, to do that, I believe but it's something that we have to fix as soon as possible. Dr. Blumberg does not suffer shoddy and foolish science quietly, and this courage contributes to making him one of our most powerful voices for impeccable quality in the foundational science of sustainable chemistry. So I've had the privilege of knowing and admiring Dr. Blumberg for well over a decade. It's, uh, we just concluded it was 14 years as an inspirational leader in chemistry and sustainability. In 2008, at the meeting at the Beckman Center, that's a, a division of the National uh, Academies of Sciences in Irvine, California, a group of endocrine disruption scientists and chemists reflected on the inability of science at that time to characterize endocrine disruptors. That was a really important meeting and some great stuff happened and some not so great stuff. That meeting led to a split, split in the green chemistry community between those who embraced the need for addressing EDCs urgent, urgently and those who did not. The meeting gave birth to what became the tiered protocol for endocrine disruptors, a large effort to define how to identify endocrine disruptors and probably the most successful uh, effort to date, absolutely the most successful effort to date to do that. Uh, on which regulatory agencies seem to be relying in rebuilding their um, ability to detract endocrine disruptors. Tamil activators became, a, that's the catalyst we make upstairs, became a beta testing platform for the type And the first publication on this involved a joint effort between CMU's Institute for Green Science and Dr. Bumberg's lab. 
and that's the that's a great paper actually in uh, the Journal of the American Chemical Society. Well, now with no more ado, I'm going to turn over the um, uh, screen to Dr. Bumberg and um, let him take over and we look forward to your lecture, Bruce. Thank you very much, Terry, and good morning, everyone. Can you see my screen? Yep. Okay, good. So I'm gonna talk about today just a bit of our work as, as, as Terry introduced that has to do with chemicals and obesity. And I'm gonna to some degree talk about the, the historical part, but mostly I'm gonna talk about the very new- Hey, Bruce, you, you have going. not, Bruce, if I may just say, you have sure. not gone, if you wanted to go to your, sometimes I do this, if you wanted to go to your slide presentation thing, you have to go and pick it and turn it on. I didn't do that. that. No, you haven't done it yet. So you right. might be seeing that. You have oh, to go and yeah. select it. I'm seeing it. Let me stop share for a moment and start sharing again. Because it worked a little bit, worked a minute ago. It did work a minute ago, yeah. Share screen. Let's pick the one to share. How about now? There you go. All right. Very good. Let me. Make the big screen so I can see everyone's smiling face. Okay, so what I'm going to talk about today are, are a little bit of the evidence, not much because it's old evidence now that there are such things as obesogens. What our work primarily is about these days is the heritability of this exposure. I'm going to show you that, uh, that uh, either a direct or an ancestral obesogen exposure modifies how we respond to diet and to fasting. I'm going to show you a little bit of data that says we believe that this effect has to do with changes in the three-dimensional structure of the DNA protein complex in every cell, which is called chromatin. We think that the way this is propagated across the generations is that the changes in structure are actually either transmitted or reconstructed every generation, and that secondarily changes other characteristics we're familiar with, like DNA methylation, which genes are expressed and potentially expression of small RNAs and, and other types of transgenerational epigenetic phenomena that people think about. And if I have time, we'll talk about a little bit of data about transgenerational changes in the metabolome. And you may or may not know, we hear about the, the DNA, the genome and the methylome and the transcriptome, but the ultimate readout of what's going on in any cell is the metabolome. Right? These are the small molecules produced by all of the biochemical reactions that go on inside the cell. And if it shows up in here, you can see that there's um, three, four generations of, of people here that we'll call um, this one the F0 generation. Her daughter is the F1, her granddaughter is the F2, and her grandson in this case, I think it's a grandson because he has a blue jumper on, is the F3. And mostly we're gonna talk about the next generation, which is the F4 generation. So an exposure to this woman while she's pregnant affects the next four generations at least. And if you um, follow the work of Mike Skinner, he's gone out to at least six generations. So the, 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 the take home message here is that what we do, especially when we're pregnant or early in life, doesn't just affect us. And it doesn't just affect our children. It may affect the next three or four generations. And that's a very sobering thought. It's one thing to, to behave cavalierly with respect to our own health, but imagine all of your descendants for the foreseeable future. That's a scary thought. Okay, so you've heard about obesity. You can see obesity as you travel around the country. Worldwide, it's tripled since 1975. The current data for the U.S. are just about 40% of U.S. population is obese. It's a little bit higher in women than in men, surprisingly. And it disproportionately affects minority groups. So almost 50% of African-American and Hispanic, and actually in women, it's over 50%. And only 12, 13% of, of the Asian population. So there are racial disparities in obesity. One of the reasons we care so much about it is that obesity adds a tremendous amount of money into the healthcare system. So something like 210 billion extra dollars are spent in healthcare because of obesity. 
And depending where I am, I, I'll, I'll joke at a university how many extra vice chancellors we could have with $210 billion. And we seem to be going there. In any case, these costs are associated with increases in things like type 2 diabetes, which is also epidemic, cardiovascular disease, hypertension, stroke, uh, 21 kinds of cancer. And these days, even death from COVID-19 is associated with obesity. People who are obese are at much higher risk of dying from COVID than people who are not obese. The prevailing wisdom is what I sarcastically call couch potato syndrome. That is that we eat too much and we exercise too little and that, that obesity is a simple mathematical function of calories in, calories out. And if you ever go to the doctor, this is the, the, the medical view of, of obesity, that it's all about us. Any history of diet or exercise in your family, that obesity is something that we control by how much we eat, how much we exercise, and if we're obese, it's our own fault. And most nutritionists and many doctors, and I've had this argument with plenty of doctors, will say calories are calorie. All calories are the same. Eat less calories and you'll lose weight. And the fast food industry would tell you that all types of calories can be part of a healthy diet, which is a little bit dodgy on its face, but that's what they say. And I think this is false. As you know, there's a lot of chemistry. You know what a calorie is. A calorie is a unit of heat energy, right? And all calories are the same, only if you're trying to burn them to heat your house. And you know how we measure these calories. This is a device may be familiar to you called a bomb calorimeter. You put a substance in here and you ignite it in pure oxygen and you measure how much heat it produces. Is that the way your body burns calories? Seriously? No, your body does not burn calories that way. Fats, proteins, and sugars are, are metabolized, are burned very differently. So if you eat many less calories than you need, right? If you go on a thousand calories a day diet of Twinkies or Ben and Jerry's, you're going to lose weight. Absolutely. But when you're close to the amount that you need, when you're somewhere close to caloric sufficiency, the type of calories matters tremendously. This energy balance equation can explain the work of David Ludwig, who showed some years ago that if you eat and people who eat the same amount of processed carbohydrates versus like you know, uh, white bread and things like that versus uh, unprocessed whole carbohydrates, that the difference in weight is not the same. The people who eat processed carbohydrates gain much more weight than those who eat whole foods. Exercise has a limited effect on weight loss and the effect is not what you think. So if you just add exercise to your lifestyle without changing your diet, chances are you're going to gain weight with time. And that weight is not just extra muscle. And this study, these studies that was listed here was mostly done in women. And it turns out that women who just start exercising without changing how they eat will end up fatter than when they started, counterintuitively. Genes don't explain obesity. The genes that we know about explain around 3% of the variance in body mass index. And it's estimated that the common variance that we may or may not have that you can detect by doing 23andMe and then sending your data off to one of the other services that tells you what the various SNPs mean might explain 20% of obesity. So that still leaves a huge amount of obesity unexplained. There's this concept that obesity may be programmed. And that concept comes from the fact that more than 83% of people who successfully lose large amounts of weight regain it. So for example, you've, you've heard of America's Biggest Loser, most likely. And it turns out that those people who work very hard, they diet, they exercise, they do everything they can, they turn their lives around. 83% of them gain the weight back. So why would that be? If you fight successfully, lose a lot of weight, why would you gain it back? That suggests that there's a programming or that you're fighting a metabolic thermostat, if you will. And that as long as you fight, you can be successful. But the moment you stop the fight, you revert back to your, your, your genetic setting, as it were, or your epigenetic setting. We know that there are other factors. Stress elevates glucocorticoid levels, and that makes you eat. How many of you have experienced stress eating? I would bet a lot. So too little sleep or disrupted circadian rhythms are associated with obesity. We'll talk a little bit more about the idea that there's such things, there may be such things as thrifty genes. More likely, there's a thrifty phenotype that evolved to make the most of scarce calories in our hunter gatherer days. 
we know that there are viruses like adeno-associated virus 36 that can be linked to obesity. We know that the composition of the bacterial uh, population in your intestines can influence obesity. And there's some wonderful studies from Jeff Gordon and Peter Turnbaugh showing that if you just transplant the microbiome from an obese human or an obese mouse into a lean mouse, you will make that animal get fat without changing anything else. You may or may not have heard of the, the studies from the University of Southampton and David Barker's thrifty phenotype, thrifty phenotype hypothesis, where Barker showed that children who were born small for gestational age often turned out to be adults who died early of cardiovascular disease. And the thinking is that there's a metabolic programming that happens early in life, when you're in the womb or in the first couple years of life, that affects how you use calories for the remainder of your life. And if there's a mismatch between what you experience during that programming period and what you experience in adulthood, you'll get very um, unexpected consequences. You may have heard of the Dutch hunger winter studies. So in 1945, the Nazis very charmingly cut off the food supply to Amsterdam, cut it off so that people had to survive on whatever was available. And the women who were in their first and second trimester of pregnancy during that time who were able to carry those babies to term, those kids became obese and their kids became obese. That's an example of a prenatal programming event. We know that if mom smokes while she's pregnant, the baby will have decreased birth weight and increased probability of obesity. So the, the prenatal and early life environment matters tremendously for what happens the rest of the life course. And we know that there are some studies that show that the environment, independent of diet and exercise, has an effect on obesity. This great study from David Allison's lab showed that our pets, laboratory animals, four different species, and feral animals like rats in cities are gaining weight in parallel with humans. So you can argue that I overfeed my cats. I do. My cat was begging me for food when I woke up this morning. But how about the rats that live in the cities? Why are they getting obese? We know that US adults are 2.3 BMI points higher in 2006 compared to 1988 at the same level of caloric intake and energy expenditure. So when you normalize for those things, still 2.3 BMI points. 2.3 doesn't sound like a lot, but 2.3 can be the difference between so-called healthy weight and obese. And a great study relatively recently has shown that patients with the highest serum concentrations of perfluorinated chemicals, which you may have heard a lot about lately, have the lowest resting metabolic rate and regain weight more quickly after dieting. So think about that for a minute. So the concentration of these chemicals in your blood is associated with the resting metabolic rate. So how much calories your body needs to maintain itself, basically how many calories you burn while you're sleeping. Okay, that's 70% of your energy expenditure in a given day. So if you fiddle with that 70%, you're going to have a tremendous impact. And the 30% that we control by our exercise and our, our waking things is a relatively small part. And we know that many chemicals, as Terry alluded to, have effects on the endocrine system. So you probably know, or you may not, or you may know that that the endocrine system is tightly linked with obesity. So you have hedonic inputs, right? You see something delicious and it makes you wanna eat it. Um, when you eat, how much you eat, um, many things are affected by the endocrine system, including the nature of fat. Since the endocrine system controls appetite, satiety, and metabolism weight, disruption of this by endocrine disrupting chemicals in the environment can certainly lead to obesity and metabolic disease. Weight and appetite and metabolism are under hormonal control. <clears throat> you may know that leptin, adiponectin, and ghrelin, especially leptin, are important. The thyroid hormone receptor is a member of the family of receptors that I'm very interested in. And we happen to have uh, one of the experts in thyroid hormone receptors sitting in the audience, Tom Zeller. Morning, Tom. This sets the resting metabolic rate, which I just alluded to a moment ago. 
Also, the development of fat cells themselves are under hormonal control. So there's a, there's a family of genes with a terrible name, peroxisome proliferator activated receptors that are important here. Uh, the name is an artifact of history. These are fatty acid receptors. And one that I cloned when I was a postdoc, PPAR gamma, is the master regulator of fat cell development. We'll hear more about PPAR gamma. But if you express PPAR gamma in a stem cell, that stem cell is now a pre-adipocyte. If you activate it, it differentiates into an adipocyte. And if you activate PPAR gamma in an existing adipocyte, it stores more triglycerides from the, from the surroundings. So it's a very important player in the whole process. So you've heard the word endocrine disrupting chemicals. And uh, um, according to the Endocrine Society in the paper that Tom was the first author of, says that an endocrine disruptor is an exogenous chemical or mixture that interferes with any aspect of hormone action. And that differs from the toxicological definition of endocrine disruptor, which would add and causes adverse consequences. So to an endocrinologist, disrupting hormone function is de facto adverse. You don't need to say, well, show me some adversity associated with this. Disrupting hormone function is adverse all by itself. And that can be the wrong signal, the absence of a signal, or the right signal at the wrong place at the wrong time or the wrong intensity. We know that hormones work at low concentration, so it shouldn't be any surprise to you that endocrine disruptors can work at low concentrations. You might ask, how are we exposed to these? Well, we're exposed by persistent pollutants in our food and water, uh, pesticides in the fruits and vegetables that we eat, food packaging itself. So we hear about packaged processed foods being troublesome, but have you thought about the packaging materials transferring endocrine disrupting chemicals to the food? Personal care products and, and cleaning materials are tremendously rich sources of endocrine disruptors that we willingly expose ourselves to. There is just a partial list of known endocrine disruptors that I stole from my friend Jerry Heindel because he likes to steal my slides, so I stole his slide too. You can see that they're, they're in different categories, herbicides, fungicides, insecticides. And it's probably not surprising that among these should be chemicals that affect the endocrine system because these are all designed to be toxic to living things. But how about industrial chemicals? Why should bisphenol A be toxic to the endocrine system? Why should um, perfluorinated chemicals? Why should phthalates? Why should these be endocrine disruptors? That doesn't intuitively make sense. You can see these fall into lots of categories and there's, there's at least a thousand known endocrine disruptors. And that, this is a soft number because we don't know how many there actually are of the millions of chemicals that are known because no one is testing in a systematic way to see which chemicals are endocrine disruptors. We've learned about these more or less by accident. I mentioned a moment ago that endocrine disruptors are in personal care products. So in this, this silly picture, you can see all of the many types of products that we use may have endocrine disruptors in them. And if you doubt whether we're actually exposed, uh, Rick Smith and Bruce Laurie wrote this book with the silly title, Slow Death by Rubber Duck. But really what these guys did is they used themselves as guinea pigs. So they may, had blood levels of various chemicals measured, phthalates, perfluorinated chemicals. And then they did things like sprayed an air freshener in a room and sat and watched television. Or they sprayed Scotchgard on a couch and they sat there on the couch and watched television and then measured the chemicals again and showed that they went straight into the bloodstream. But just by using products in the way in which they were intended, the endocrine disrupting chemicals that we're talking about were found in the bloodstream later. So that should say to you very strongly that use chemicals, you will be exposed and the chemicals will get inside your body. And the question is what effect will they have? Well, we know some of those effects. Not everyone agrees with this. Right? The chemical industry doesn't agree, and they have some, some uh, journals that they fund, and they have what I call pet journal editors who would argue very strongly that this is nothing to be concerned about. And this, this guy here says, we in the business community prefer a cautious wait-and-see approach over needless media scaremongering, ignoring the fact that he's grown breasts that he ought not to have. It's, it's, sometimes I put Donald Trump's picture there since he did so many nice things at the EPA, but I didn't do that today. If you 
believe that, I would offer you this counter evidence from uh, Tracy Woodruff and her colleagues that shows that many diseases and reproductive order disorders are on the increase, testicular cancer, various kinds of birth defects, and reproductive function is on the decrease. So you either have heard already or you will hear Shanna Swan talk about the decreased fertility of, of men around the world. So we're well on the way to um, causing extinction of all species that use hormones to control their reproduction. So many, many bad things are happening. Of course, the industry guys don't believe that. So here's the ostrich with his head in the sand and here's the toxicology journal editor with his head in the sand. And they say really silly things publicly like non-monotonic low dose effects defy common sense. There really can't be such a thing as a chemical that works at a low dose. And they say, are endocrine disruptor effects really adverse? Is it troublesome that we should change the expression of genes? Is it troublesome that you should be exposed to more estrogens? Even more strangely, they say, how can we believe animal studies? They will actually argue that the results that we do, the studies that we do in animals are not relevant because they're done in animals and humans are not animals. Leaving out the fact that all the safety studies they do are done in animals. So the chemicals are safe because they tested them in animals and you should believe that. But my experiments and other people's experiments that show the chemicals are not safe because they're done in animals are not relevant to humans because humans are not animals. And I would say you need to pick a position. Whatever position it is, pick it and be consistent. So if animal effects predict effects on humans, then the safety studies may be relevant and certainly the hazard studies are relevant. And if animal effects don't predict effects on humans, then you should ignore all the studies because they have nothing to do with humans. Another thing they say is that effects are transient will disappear after exposure stops. And the data I'm gonna show you and the data that many other people have produced say, this is not correct. And I showed this picture at a meeting of the Toxicology Society a few years ago and they were not happy with me, but really this is Fred Flintstone science. This is the most archaic science you could possibly imagine, stone age science. Okay, so enough criticizing the, the government and chemical industry. Let's talk about what I woke up early to talk to you about today. And the question we're asking is, are endocrine disruptor mediated disturbances and endocrine signaling involved in this pandemic of obesity? And this is a cartoon showing, you know, a few generations and we're currently in this generation XXXL and who knows what the next generation is gonna look like. That's a cartoon, here's a picture. We actually have lots and lots of fat kids in the US. And I remember when my daughter was a baby and the pediatrician was very concerned because she was only in the fifth percentile for size. And he wanted her to be bigger than that. And I remember a postdoc I had who was very proud that her kid was in the 95th percentile for, for height and weight when he was a little kid. Well, that kid's obese now. And the sad thing is that kids who look like this very often turn out to be adults who look like this. And I don't know how it is in Pittsburgh, but even in California, we see people, obese people driving these little carts around because they basically have to, because it's too much effort to walk. We need to prevent this from happening. I'm sure that this guy doesn't want to be obese. And we need to make it so that it's less likely that will happen. So as Terry said some years ago, we developed what I call the obesogen hypothesis. And according to me, obesogens are chemicals that stimulate the development of, of fat cells and storage in those cells. And they can do that multiple ways by affecting the cells directly, by disturbing the homeostasis of fat tissue, the birth and death rate of fat cells, altering the control of appetite and satiety and or metabolism. So the ultimate effect is that you have increased adiposity in vivo. So animals get fat, people get fat. Well, this was first shown by Retha Newbold and her colleagues at NIEHS. And Retha showed that when you expose mice to one part, five, five parts per billion of diethylstilbestrol in the first few days after birth, at about eight months old, these animals got incredibly obese. And to confound the toxicologist, if she exposed them to five parts per million, a thousand fold higher, the animals did not get obese. 
And that's already a toxicological paradox there, right? You have an effect at high dose and a different effect at a low dose. We know that drugs that activate our friend PPAR gamma used to be used to treat type 2 diabetes. They're called have the thiazolidine diones. Um, the, the, the chemical names are, the, the pharmaceutical names are Actos and Avandia. These increase fat storage and the number of fat cells in humans. So we know that if humans take these drugs, they will have more fat cells at any age that they take them. There are several studies that show that the concentration of phthalates in urine are associated with waste diameter and insulin resistance in humans. And many, many chemicals have been linked with obesity in epidemiological studies. Now, of course, that doesn't prove that those chemicals caused obesity. What it says, we ought to test in animals whether the chemicals cause obesity or not. There's a number of chemicals, and we've done a lot of work in this area that I won't necessarily talk about, show that if you treat cells with a variety of chemicals, you can cause those cells to become fat cells. And during that, we showed that a class of chemicals called organotins, which I'll talk about most of the rest of the lecture, are very potent obesogens. So I think these data and the data that I've produced, other labs have produced, say that the existence of obesogens is plausible. It's not just my personal fantasy, my way to scam NIH out of research dollars. There's at least 50 chemicals that we know cause animals to become fat, cause and effect, or are associated with obesity in humans. So this is something perhaps it's worth taking seriously. Sorry, I need to be caffeinated. It's early in the morning here. So here's our favorite obesogen, tributyl tin. That's how it looks. Tributyl tin used to be used as an anti-fouling agent on ship hulls, and it was a kind of a breakthrough when it was used because the previous chemical used was copper, and copper kills all kinds of marine invertebrates. So I keep um, coral reef aquariums, and if you want to kill an aquarium, drop a few parts per billion of copper in there. So tributyl tin was a big advantage because it didn't kill everything like copper did. But unfortunately, it caused sex change in gastropod mollusks. Tributyltin is used as a thermal stabilizer in vinyl plastics. It's not intentionally there. It's called a non-intentionally added substance, an IS. The main chemical used is dibutyltin. And tributyltin is a contaminant of dibutyltin. But guess what? Dibutyltin is an obesogen also. It's used as a wood preservative. And if you go and vacuum the dust up in your house, in my house, in Terry's house, and send that off for testing, you will find organotins in there. So we showed many years ago that tributyltin was an activator at nanomolar levels, parts per billion of our friend PPAR gamma, which works as a heterodimer with RxR. And that when we exposed mice in utero to low doses of this chemical, they got fat. We showed that this prenatal exposure could reprogram the fate of a class of stem cells called mesenchymal stem cells, which are the precursors of fat cells and which also regenerate fat cells and bone cells throughout your life, it predisposed them to become adipocytes. We've done a lot of work on those cells that showed that EBT activating this half of the heterodimer, the RxR half, could promote commitment of those cells to the fat lineage. And that when you do that, when you activate RxR with EBT or other chemicals that activate it, not only do you make more fat cells, but these fat cells are unhealthy. They don't behave the way normal fat cells should. So they're really good at storing fat, but they're not so good at giving it up again. So imagine that you made a one-way fat cell that stores fat, but doesn't like to give it up again. And that's a pretty bad thing to do. And the last is that we showed these effects of TBT on obesity are heritable. We've done a bunch of transgenerational experiments now, and I'll go through a few of those because for me, this is the most exciting result. And this is what we're completely devoted to studying over the last five years and probably for the next however many years until I retire. So this is Raquel Chamorro Garcia and she came to my lab about 10 years ago, 11 years ago now. And she undertook to do a transgenerational experiment. And we did this because of the work of Mike Skinner. So Mike had shown that exposing rats to a chemical called vinclozolin, 
which is um, fungicide, could cause many, many adverse consequences through at least the third and fourth generation later. So what Raquel did is she exposed mice to three concentrations of tributyl tin. And I'll introduce a term for you that no L means the no observed adverse effect level. So this is the level that toxicologists infer below which there will be no effect. And this is, it's a kind of a fake number. It's not a real number. So what they do is they calculate what's the lowest level at which you see an adverse effect. And then they divide that by usually a hundred to account for various differences in the system. And they call that the no observed effect level. So here we have three different doses and the lowest dose is 50 times lower than the no effect level or five times lower than the no effect level or two times higher. So she exposed mice in the drinking water throughout pregnancy and looked at the pups and then killed some and mated some. We went out to the third generation. And according to Mike Skinner's terminology, if you see an effect when you treat a female, if you see an effect in the F1 and the F2 generation, you call this a multi-generational or an intergenerational effect. And that's because the F1 is exposed as a fetus, but the F2 is exposed as a germ cell inside the F1. So all three generations are exposed. The mom's exposed F0, the child's exposed F1, and the grandchild's exposed F2. These are all exposed to the chemical during that in utero exposure. And you may have seen a paper that just came out uh, last week from Barbara Cohn and Michelle Lemerle looking at a cohort of humans, the Kaiser Permanente Bay Area cohort, where they could associate grandmom's exposure to DDT with effects in the granddaughters. So this is a multi-generational effect. And we distinguish that from a transgenerational effect that occurs in F3 and beyond in which there was no exposure. So any effect that you see in the F3, the F4, the F5 generation is, has no, it's not due to the direct effects of the chemical, it's due to some other effect. And we call those typically epigenetic effects. And what Raquel showed is that the animals, the overall body weight didn't change, but they had more white adipose tissue. They had more and larger white adipocytes. <clears throat> the brown adipose tissue didn't look normal. The mesenchymal stem cells were predisposed to become fat cells like we showed earlier, and they had fatty liver. And you may or may not know that we, are, we also have an epidemic of fatty liver in the US. So the major questions we've been working on ever since that paper, it's like eight years now, is what changes did we cause at the tissue level that caused these animals to store more fat? We studied that in transgenerational experiments two and three. And then how does this interact with the, the Western diet? And these are upcoming experiments that we haven't done yet. The most exciting thing for me is how are these effects transmitted across the generation? So what carries this effect from one generation to the next? This is a fundamental question in biology. So here we see we expose the great, great grandparents, and then we see effects in the F4 descendants. And then what we really, another thing we really want to know is can we identify metabolomic biomarkers of exposure? So can we look, for example, in this group of people we have here collected today and see who was directly or ancestrally exposed to an obesogen? And if you knew that, whether you were exposed or not, you might behave differently. You might eat differently. You might change your lifestyle to account for the predisposition that you have. So the easiest way to do that is to, is to have these metabolomic biomarkers. And I'll show you a little bit of data along these lines if I have time. And that's, we've been studying that for quite a while now. And we'll, we'll get there. So Raquel set out to do this again because you always have to repeat experiments. So we call that T2, transgenerational experiment two. And this time for various reasons, we decided to extend the period of exposure all the way out to when the pups were weaned. So throughout pregnancy and lactation. We only used two doses of TBT, the two lowest doses. And we kicked out the other control rosiglitazone because it wasn't really a control. We went out to the F4 generation. And we looked at things like the transcriptome, the methylome, what do you do to the mesenchymal stem cells? And we started to study now body composition. 
and what did we do to the sperm and things like that. So I'll show you a little bit of this data. It's, it's not um, so new anymore, it's 2017. So when we finished the experiment at the F4 generation, we had some animals left. So we decided to, to do something to those. So we gave them a diet challenge. So what we did is the animals had been exposed throughout their life to a relatively low fat diet, 13% fat. And then we switched them to a fat that a diet that was higher in fat, but it's still pretty low fat. 21.6% is a low fat diet, but it's higher than 13%. We kept them on that diet for six weeks and then we switched them back for six more weeks. And we did some fasting experiments and body composition. So what we could show is that as you, you probably don't know, unless you work on mice, that when you fast mice, they lose weight really fast. So if you look at the body weight in a four hour fast or a overnight fast, in an overnight fast, they lost about eight or 9% of their body weight. And that was reflected both in lean mass and in fat mass. The animals that were exposed to TBT in the four hour fast, they didn't really lose as much weight. And you can see that that, that difference is reflected in increased, flat, increased fat mass, but this isn't statistically significant. But in the overnight fast, you can see now there's a very big difference in the fat. So these animals did not lose as much fat as the animals that hadn't been treated with TBT. Now remember, treated with TBT four generations before. So these happen to be male animals. You don't see this effect in females. Again, we found that the overall body weight didn't change. So the dotted line is the ancestrally TBT exposed and the solid line is the vehicle. There's no real difference when we change to the high fat diet, they both get heavier. And then when we, when we change the diet back, they, they lose a little bit of that weight. However, when you look at body composition, the story is not the same. So look at, this is the F4 males and down here in, in red is the fat content. So you can see already at the beginning of the diet challenge, these animals are a little bit fatter, not hugely fatter, but a little bit fatter, but immediately in a week, they become obese and they continue to get fat. And when we switch the diet back, they give up some of the fat, but they never get back to baseline. All right. So these animals were programmed by their great grandmother's exposure or the great great grandmother's exposure to tributyl 10. It says something important too, that body weight is not an acceptable surrogate for obesity. The toxicology literature is full of papers that say the animals didn't gain weight, therefore they're not obese. These animals didn't gain weight either, but the body composition changed. They stored more fat. This is not the case in females. So the female animals get a little bit heavier, but this never achieves statistical significance. And when you change the diet back, they go right back to baseline. So this is a male specific, effect in the F4 generation. Okay, so I showed you some biology. We have fat accumulation at eight weeks response to diet and they didn't mobilize fat during fasting. So of course we wanted to know what's going on here. What might be underlying that? So we looked at several things, the mesenchymal stem cells and the liver and the fat. And I'll just show you a little bit of, of data because it, it makes a point that I, that I wanna tell you about. So the first thing we did is we looked at DNA methylation. You may have read papers by Mike Skinner showing that DNA methylation changes in the, the later generations. And what you see here is just a, a crude plot of all the chromosomes and the regions that have more methylation than control are in red above and regions that have less are in blue. And you can see there's lots and lots of differences in DNA methylation. And I would also, uh, point out that this is in four animals, and we only put a mark if it occurs in four out of four. Okay, so these are the most pervasive effects, and that's a very good p-value. But this is not possible, right? This result is not possible, as people tell me, because germline reprogramming erases methylation every generation. In fact, twice a generation. It gets erased in the zygote, and it gets erased when the germ cells are formed. But yet, the methylation is different. So how do we account for that? You have to be able to account for it. It's a real observation. <laughs> so you could look at it in several ways. You may know that DNA methylation should directly express gene, uh, directly affect gene expression. So you, if you look at um, sites 
in subset one that might be close to a gene in the promoter or something, or in subset two, you know, in between genes reasonably nearby? The answer is that when you look at methylation and the genes whose expression has changed, there's no link whatsoever. And this was a very depressing result because that was the easy, sensible thing. But yet we still had to account for the, for the data that we had. These animals got fat. Why? So we decided to look at it in a different way. So we asked the question, what happens if we consider methylation together? If you look at regions where the methylation is all in one direction, and we call these isodirectional differentially methylated blocks, isodMBs. So this shows a, a hypermethylated isodMB. And you can see that there's lots of these. Remember that picture I just showed you? Here's just picking out chromosome seven. You can see that there's regions where all, it's all hypermethylated, all hypo, hyper, hypo. So there's lots of these in the genome. So maybe, maybe something's going on here. And if you look hypothetically, so here's some hypermethylated isodMBs, here's some hypo. And the DNA content isn't the same. So the, the, the percentage of GC versus AT base, base pairs isn't uniform across the genome. So you can divide that into regions that um, some people have called isochores. Really, this, so let's just call this percent GC. And there's genes here, and some of them expression might be changed, and some might not be. So when we look at gene expression through the lens of isodMBs, now we get a different result. Remember, I showed you there was no effect with gene expression and methylation. But when we looked at isodMBs and gene expression, now we can see all of a sudden we change lipid and fatty acid metabolism genes. These are located in regions that have isodMBs. And if you plot these onto cellular metabolic pathways, you can see that there's some genes that are underexpressed and genes that are overexpressed. And we can spend a whole lecture just on these genes and what they do. But here's one that's really quite important. I mentioned it earlier, leptin. So leptin is the uh, metabolic sensor. Or it's, a, it's, it's, a, it's used to tell the brain whether you have enough fat stores or not. And Leptin is located at a hypomethylated and undermethylated isodMB. You can see here, there's, there's two methylation sites here, and they're undermethylated in four out of four males. And you can see that leptin messenger RNA is overexpressed, and leptin protein is overexpressed. And clinically, when you see obesity and you see elevated leptin levels, it means the animals or the people are leptin resistant. And it's the case that many obese people are leptin resistant. So of course we have to prove that and we haven't done it yet. But the, the supposition is that, the, that these animals are leptin resistant. So what we think is going on, and I'll show you the evidence in a moment, is that TBT has altered the three-dimensional structure of chromatin that favors the expression of obesity promoting genes. So if you look at the chromatin in a normal cell, it's not uniform, the DNA, and proteins looks like a bowl of spaghetti or a bowl of noodles. But these noodles or spaghetti have a structure and there are regions that like to be together and like to be different from other regions. So this structure is important and it's maintained. And the nature of this structure affects things like DNA methylation, chromatin accessibility, histone methylation, gene expression is all secondary to the structure of the chromatin. So it turns out that these hypomethylated, the undermethylated isodMBs map to regions of increased GC content that other people have already showed correspond to topologically associated domains and loops in the chromatin. Because we observe isodMBs rather than specific DNA methylated regions, that may explain why you can't easily reproduce a specific change in a methylation site in transgenerational studies. That's always been a very vexing problem. So if you, if you, you talk to, to Mike, you'll find out that methylation sites are different in every generation and every tissue. So if methylation is carrying the inheritance, that's a tough one to explain. 
But what we think is carrying the inheritance is that the TBT exposure has disrupted the three-dimensional structure of chromatin, which alters access to the programming, programming enzymes like methylases and demethylases and histone methyltransferases and the expression of small RNAs. And that that leads to regional changes in gene expression. Of course, those are, those are, uh, are big words. What can I show you to back that up? So when we did this experiment and the reviewers of this paper said, well, you got to show us, show us some change in methylation that's, that's, that's heritable, some change that's heritable. So what we had left from that experiment was sperm. And we used an, a, a, a technique called ATAC-seq, which stands for assay for transposase accessible chromatin. What that does is it measures the ability of chromatin to be attacked by a transposase. So the ability to be broken up. If the chromatin is tightly condensed, it's not accessible. And if it's open, it is accessible. So the readout is accessible and inaccessible regions. We had F4 fat and we had methylation. And you had hypo, hyper and hypomethylated isodMBs. So the question is, is there any association? Can we make any link? And that a, was a bit of a long shot, I have to say. But it turns out that there was a link that in regions in the white adipose tissue that were hypomethylated isoDMBs turned out to be preferentially inaccessible in the sperm. So there's a link between methylation in the white adipose tissue and accessibility in the sperm. So regions that were not accessible in the sperm turned out to be hypomethylated in the fat and vice versa. Regions that were hypermethylated in the fat were more accessible in the sperm. So we have a link between chromatin structure and methylation in the somatic tissues. It turns out that these regions that are inaccessible in the sperm that are hypomethylated in the fat have genes that are relevant to metabolism. And if you use something called gene ontology to kind of crunch this big data set, you can see that there are lots and lots of genes that are expressed in these regions that are meaningful. And some of the same genes are expressed in F3 and F4. So if I summarize in cartoon form, you can imagine there's different types of regions, right? So there's inaccessible and accessible in the sperm. Okay, and it's F3 and F4. So we measured that in the F4 generation white adipose tissue, but the F4 sperm are really the F5 generation that we didn't analyze. In fat, you have regions that are hypomethylated and hypermethylated. We have genes that are overexpressed and underexpressed. And some features that are invariant in chromatin, the GC content, high GC, low GC. And it turns out for whatever region, reason, nature put genes that are involved in metabolism in these high GC regions and regions that are low GC are depleted in genes related to metabolism. But that's just the way the genome was designed. And we showed that this DNA sequence composition, the GC content, is linked with higher order chromatin structure and therefore the TBT is altering nuclear architecture. Okay, so we, we did a pilot experiment to test whether this was true or not. So we exposed a pregnant mom to TBT and we took the pups and we took the, the, the gonads from these, the, the tissues that will become male and female. And we pulled them by litter and sex. So we took the, the, the male fetuses and the female fetuses and pooled those gonads. We isolated the primordial germ cells, the cells that will give rise to the sperm and the egg, and we did a tax seek on those. So we asked the question, did this exposure to tributyltin change accessibility of chromatin in the primordial germ cells? Can we reproduce what we saw in the, the four generation experiment? And the answer is something's going on. But when you do, um, unsupervised correlation clustering, basically that to let the computer tell you what's like one other thing. You can see that, first of all, that the males and females separate. That's, that's comforting, right? Because males and females should be different. And that in the males, that the TBT group together and the vehicle group together. And in females, they're all mixed up. If you do principal component analysis, you can see here's the controls. And here's the TBT. So they're a little bit spread out, but they're very distinct from the controls. And if you look at which genes are the same, comfortingly, most of them are the same. 
between vehicle and TBT, but some of them are, are in one and some are in the other. It turns out that if you plot the PGC accessibility versus the F4 sperm accessibility, you can see that there's quite a bit of overlap between the genes that are accessible in the PGCs and the genes that were accessible in the sperm. Something interesting is happening here. And this, this pilot study got us a big five-year NIH grant to dig into what's going on there. So this F0 TBT exposure led to changes in F1 chromatin accessibility. It only is obvious in the males. We don't really know why that is. And this happens at embryonic day 13.5. So that's the time in development when the primordial germ cells have migrated to the gonads and at which the sexes are different from each other. So we think that this effect may be carried by altered chromatin structure and accessibility in the male germline. And that this structure is either inherited or reassembles every generation that leads to regional changes in DNA methylation and all the other um, phenomena that are associated with transgenerational inheritance. They're all secondary to structure. So here's a model. I won't show you all the data that supports it, but if you imagine this is a, a bit of chromatin and on that chromatin, you have regions that are enriched in GC, regions that are enriched in AT, and there's some genes. So the red ovals are metabolic process genes. And the squares are chromatin organization genes. And those are both changed in these experiments. And there's other genes in, the, in blue are detection of stimulus genes, which have nothing to do with anything. They're just to show that something didn't change. So this structure is normally regenerated every generation. So the normal structure is there. And when you know uh, animals breed or when people get together and, and produce children, that normal structure is, is recapitulated every generation. What we think is that an environmental stressor like TBT or perhaps like other chemicals or, or um, diet or stress altered this structure. And it altered the expression of the genes that affect this intergenerational reconstruction such that the altered structure is recapitulated or recreated every generation. So if the normal structure is recreated, why wouldn't the, the altered structure be recreated? And I don't have the data to show you, but we're, we're using a technique called high c that measures chromatin contacts. And we're following that across four generations and we see consistency. So that'll be the next paper that you see from us. So let me, it's in the few minutes I have, how much time do I have left, Terry? You're, you're muted, I can't hear you. Still can't hear you. Okay, never mind. Um, <clears throat> will I talk about this? Sorry, I, I uh, please, please finish up as you're going. We have, have slightly less than 20 minutes before the class is over. It'd be good to have some time for uh, discussion, yeah. but yeah, okay. I'll talk a little bit about metabolomics. So here's the T2 experiment that I showed you first, where the animals got fat in the F4 generation. So what we did is we had some blood plasma left. And it turns out that I met a guy named Daniel Zalko at, at a meeting, and Daniel is an expert in metabolomics. And he said, you know, your talk is very interesting. Um, do you have any tissues left? Because we, we do metabolomics. I think we have some plasma left. So we sent Daniel the plasma from the animals before the diet challenge and at the end of the diet challenge, eight weeks and 33 weeks. And he did proton NMR metabolomics and he asked, what's going on in the plasma of these animals? So when you do these experiments, the, the, you, you get metabolites that are changed, but it's often very convenient to reduce these to something like a principal component, right? And these are called PLSDA plots. And this is females and these are males and the vehicle are in green and the, the TBT are in blue. And obviously you don't need to be a metabolo metabolomics expert to see that these are really different. This is the F4 generation before the diet challenge. Okay, and you get almost ridiculously high correlation coefficients, very close to one. This means this is very, very meaningful. 
It also says that the differences in phenotype exist before the diet challenge. So one criticism you could make of our experiment is that, well, the diet challenge caused the change. This says that the differences existed before we did the diet challenge. After the diet challenge, you see that in females, the effect is lost. There's no difference. And in males, the difference is still there. Okay, does that make sense? But we can see differences in the metabolome before the diet challenge in males and females. But after the diet challenge, we only see it in males and we only saw the phenotype in males. So something interesting is going on there. So this paper is actually, it says in preparation, this paper is submitted and we're waiting to hear about it. Also part of that paper and the real aim of our study is to find out what's going on in the liver of these animals. So this is now the next experiment, T3, where we've gone back to the in utero exposure only, and we went through four generations. And in the F3 generation, we took the livers and we did proton NMR. We looked at the transcriptome and we looked at the, at the nonpolar and the polar metabolites by mass spectrometry. And the idea is that from these results, from, the, from combining the gene expression with what metabolites are there, that tells you which, which genes, which pathways were affected, right? You can get to many metabolites by different pathways. By observing where gene expression changed, you can infer which pathway of the multiple possible pathways were changed. And what we hope to get from that is both biomarkers that we can ask the question, who was previously exposed, but also the mechanisms, right? So which pathways were changed so we can go back and look at our structural data, our chromatin structure and say, do we see changes in the regions where these genes are located? Okay, that's, that's the ultimate goal. And as, as you may appreciate, these are colossally big data sets and there aren't tools to handle such data sets. So that's what we want to, that's where we want to get. So I'll just show you the beginning of this experiment. Here's the females and the males. This is proton NMR. This is uh, polar metabolites. This is lipidomics. And again, you can see that we have really robust changes before, this is actually after. This is after the diet challenge from 28 weeks old animals. So we really have robust differences again with the same crazy high correlation coefficients. So this is a very robust experiment that's likely to tell us something exciting. And we're, we're working on this now. This, this is, will be another paper out before too long. So what have I told you about obesogen exposures? These organotins, tributyltin, dibutyltin are very good activators of these two important nuclear receptors at the kinds of levels to which you and I are exposed, parts per billion levels, low nanomolar. And they actually work as well as the best synthetic activators. I didn't show you data on this, but TBT produces a commitment of mesenchymal stem cells to the fat lineage, and it makes unhealthy fat cells when it does that. The effects of this maternal exposure are transgenerational. When you expose a female, a pregnant female, these effects last at least four generations. We haven't gone longer because a year is about as long as we want to mess with these animals. And these four generation experiments take a year from start to finish. So we see altered white adipose depot size, uh, size of white adipocytes, gene expression, liver. We see altered DNA methylation that we think is secondary to large scale changes in chromatin structure. The ultimate result of this is we get this transgenerational leptin resistant thrifty phenotype that makes these animals respond differently to fat in the diet and to fasting. And that TBT exposure induces detectable, reproducible changes in the metabolome, at least as far as the F4 generation. So of course, the question everyone asks me is, are organotins making me fat? Is that why, is that the responsible, is that what's causing the obesity pandemic? And the answer is, well, we know that adult exposure can induce adipogenic genes. We know that drugs that activate PPR gamma increase obesity and make more fat cells. We know that prenatal exposure leads to permanent changes in the adult phenotype and in the offspring. 
course, we need to know if humans are exposed to adequate to sufficient levels of TBT for concern. So the answer is <laughs> nobody's measuring. No surprise. But I can tell you that three that PVC is three percent by weight, hundred millimolar of organotins. Now most of that is dibutyltin and dioctyltin, so that's good. God help us if it was tributyltin. But TBT is a, is present as contaminant of dibutyltin at a percent or so. So now you're looking at millimolar, one millimolar. So that's still a lot even there as a contaminant. Triphenyltin is used as a fungicide, as an amiticide on crops. If you have a well, you need to have it flushed periodically. And one of the things they use to flush it is triphenyltin. Tributyltin is present at around you know, 27 nanomolar in the blood of a small number of people. It wasn't detected in a small cohort of Danish women the National Toxicology Program did. What do you think is different between American homes and Danish homes? What do we use a lot that they don't use at all? Vinyl plastic. If you go to Scandinavia, most homes have wood inside, wood floors, wood cabinets, don't have vinyl floors and vinyl blinds and things like that. Tin is detected in blood, and we know that plastic storage reduces the concentration. This is work of Hans Joachim Lemler, who showed that all the studies that have been done measuring TBT in blood that are collected in plastic containers underestimate the TBT concentration by many fold. And we know that triphenyltin in Finnish fishermen is relatively low. They didn't find any TBT, but it's in the placentas, 100 nanomolar or TBT in the placentas. And it's associated with increased pondral index in these, so how big the kids are. I'm told by Yorma Tapari that they're going back into this cohort to see the kids are 20 to 22 years old now, maybe even older than that. And they're trying to get funding to, to follow up and ask the question, did these, was there an association between that prenatal exposure in the placenta to tributyltin and some phenotype when the kids are adults? And one day I'll have the answer for you. Some would claim the TBT expo the exposure is decreasing because it's been largely banned from ship hulls. And that's probably true from the marine environment. So you're going to get less of it from fish than you used to. But we don't know about the human population because no one's doing biomonitoring. And since DBT is an obesogen and induces a pre-diabetic condition in mice, I'm going to say I don't think the levels are dropping. So is the environment making us fat? Well, I'm not sure that you can make that conclusion, but I think you can say fairly comfortably that the environment is giving us a predisposition to obesity that combined with our lifestyle and the way that we eat is causing the worldwide obesity pandemic. So what's the take home message for students? First is that diet and exercise by themselves are insufficient to explain the obesity epidemic or pandemic. We know that there are such things as obesogens that promote fat storage and, and fat cell development because there are pharmaceutical obesogens. We've done the cause and effect experiments, okay? Diazolidine, dione, anti-diabetic drugs make people fat. Atypical antipsychotics like olanzapine and most kinds of antidepressants make people fat when they take them. So you have a cause and effect in humans. So the, the best evidence for chemical obesogens is actually pharmaceutical obesogens. So chemicals like thiazolidine diones that tickle PPR gamma, why wouldn't environmental chemicals that do the same thing to PPR gamma have exactly the same effect? And we know some of those, organotins, there are estrogens, many fungicides, organophosphate, pesticides, and parabens are associated with obesity. We know that prenatal exposure reprograms exposed animals to be fat. We know that there are epigenetic changes that alter the fate of stem cells. And we know that we've altered chromatin structure and chromatin accessibility that leads ultimately to changes in DNA methylation and gene expression. I love this cartoon. His, his epigenome is interacted with the ice cream he's eating to make him obese, just like my mice. But seriously, the existence of obesogen shifts the paradigm strongly from treatment to prevention. Yes, we want to help obese people not be obese anymore. But even more importantly, we want to prevent kids from becoming obese in the first place. 
because the data say that obesity is intractable. When you become obese, it is almost impossible to lose that weight permanently. So the best way to prevent it, to stop it, is to prevent it. And we know how to do that. Reduce exposure to obesogens, optimize nutrition, exercise, living in unpolluted environments. So the, 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 the recipe is available for how not to be obese. We just need to use it. Testing for effects of chemical exposure. I'll take one, one last dig. And this is cartoon says, um, we do test for the safety of pesticides in your food. It's kind of a long-term test. And we are the subjects and our children are the subjects and the results are in, aren't they? We know that our chemical industry, our regulatory structure is allowing the population to become fat. I would say for best results, no obesogens, do not disturb, right? No obesogens, especially when you're pregnant. And there's a, a developing evidence that says it's not just mom's exposure, it's also dad's exposure that's problematic. So we need to just not have obesogen exposure as much as we can. Okay, I'm gonna stop there and I hope you have some questions. Thank you very much. Where's the stop sharing? Well, uh... Bruce, of course, uh, is wonderfully uh, biology by fire hose. And so you uh, all got a really brilliant dose of biology there. And uh, the main thing, of course, is that you capture several things. Number one, if you're going to be successful in dealing with endocrine disruption, you're, you're going to need to be able to communicate with people like Bruce, which means that you have to work to understand how he thinks and what he does. Um, the second thing is, um, I'm pretty sure some of you do have questions. So uh, please lead with any questions that you have. Otherwise I'll have a few more comments. Jenna, are you looking like you're ready to ask a question? Yeah, I do have a question. Um, well, yeah, fire. Uh, thank you for the talk. I guess my question goes, all the way back to the beginning of your story, um, when you talked about how the environmental disruption starts when TBT binds to um, RXR, and then there's mm -hmm. the, the PP, or I don't know if the other one's correct, but- Actually binds to both of them. Okay, yeah. And I guess um, just in, in natural circumstances, um, what would, what, normally binds to those? Is it a hormone? And then what does the structure of that chemical look like compared to the tributyl tin? Does it look structurally similar or is, is it- Excellent question. So they're not structurally similar at all. So we don't know what endogenously binds to RXR. Some people claim it's a nine cis retinoic acid, but I don't think that's a physiological ligand. So we do not know the physiological ligand, but there are some. PPAR gamma is a fatty acid receptor. So tributyltin doesn't look like either of those, but actually William Bourget has crystallized it together with RXR and PPAR gamma. I can show that it binds. It binds in a weird way. Instead of binding in the pocket like the, the normal chemicals do, it binds covalently to a cysteine residue in the ligand binding domain. So it gets on and never comes off, unlike other ligands that, you know, they're on and off and on and off that there's an equilibrium. It binds and it stays there. Uh, okay. Does that answer your question? Yeah, that does answer my question. So okay. in the F0, if they were exposed to TBT, it would basically be blocking, blocking that receptor for a long period of their life. Oh, no, it doesn't block it. It activates it. So it binds there and it activates okay. constitutively, um, where the normal hormone would bind and then come off again. That makes sense. Okay, thank you. Uh, anybody else have a question? So, I mean, I think Too much that, biology. No, 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 no. It's actually, I, what's really, really good about the, the, the cultural differences or the scientific differences between the fields is that, um, there, there, there is a significant barrier to uh, trying to understand a, a true expert, and you have listened to a true expert this morning. 
um, in, in another field. Uh, what you need to learn is that actually you, you have to have the courage to tackle uh, trying to understand somebody like Dr. Blumberg when he speaks. And I can tell you it's hard. <laughs> and it took, took its take, I don't understand it all by any means, but I've got a lot of the key messages by listening to Dr. Blumberg over the years and reading various things that he's written. Uh, and it, it's amazing. I've actually so, had similar experience to, to what you guys just experienced. So every few years, I get invited to be on, uh, on chemistry qualifying exams. So at, at UCI, the advancement, the, the advancement candidacy exams are all at the, in spring of the second year in a two week period for all the chemistry graduate students. So they always invite an outside person that me as a biologist, I'm listening to all these really intricate nuances and advances in organic chemistry. I'm thinking, my God, my head is spinning. I have no idea what I'm hearing. So I can sympathize with what you guys just listened to. How, however, you did get really critical messages. So here's a tiny amount of this chemical going in. And remember what you're always interested in, what's the big, what's the big message for, for what's happening? And I, I think if I got you right, Bruce, it's changing in the shape of chromatin. Now, many of you may not know what chromatin is. Chromatin is a complex of DNA, the chromosomes, and proteins that wrap it up in particular ways. Correct, Bruce? Mm -hmm. Let me go back. You can sort of see it on the first slide here. And so it's the change. So here's the nucleus, the DNA, it's all wound. So this is the, the wound up structure of DNA with uh, nucleosomes bound to it. Maybe that's not as good a picture as I thought, but so chromatin is the, is the, the, the double strand of DNA with histone associated with it. About every 200 base pairs, it's wrapped around a, a histone octamer. And then that has a three-dimensional structure on top of that. It loops, it bulges, pieces, megabases away, come back and touch other pieces. The DNA is a very um, convoluted structure. Imagine you have really a long distance, 10 meters or more in a, in a you know, 10 micron nucleus. It's all wound up and packed in there. So the way that it's packed is, is not random. And, and the protein which genes are expressed. Is, and the protein histone is sort of this anchor point which globs every so often along the chain uh, form a sort of a like a, a lights hanging on a on a on a strand of uh, a couple of uh, wires but then those stick together and when you roll it up it rolls up in a very particular and it's changing in that sort of rolling up structure mm -hmm. that's making the difference and so the, the, the these changes aren't occurring if I, if I have Dr. Dr. Blumberg correctly, through nothing's happening to the DNA, it's happening. The sequence to the hasn't changed. Yeah. Right. So this is and this that is epigenetic. Gets passed on. You, yeah. And so that's epigenetic is the term for that. It's not. It's beyond genetics. Mm -hmm. uh, it's the wrapping up of the of the of the of the DNA gets changed, and whereas normally without these insults, this packaging is very strictly uh, retained intergenerationally. Once you disturb it, you now get a new kind of packaging and that gets locked in. And therefore the access to the genes that need to be read, the, the, which requires unwrapping of the structure by uh, enzymes that demethylate or methylate or to wrap up or demethylate or acetylate or deacetylate, both are, both are, both are going on. Mm -hmm. That changes, and so suddenly you've got a new creature. Let now, me make is... an analogy that might explain it. So, to the extent that you've ever taken genetics, you know that mutations in 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 genes lead to changes in the structure of the protein and maybe and can can break it. Right. Classic example would be. Um, um, cystic fibrosis, right, which is a, a defect in a chloride transporter. 
let me give a different example. So there's a, a lot of tumor suppressor genes we know. So mel melanoma is, ex is associated to some degree with the loss of expression of a tumor suppressor gene called P10, P-T-E-N. So if that gene is mutated and lost, you get melanoma. If you methylate that gene a lot, its expression is lost and you get melanoma. Totally different mechanisms, but the same outcome, no functional protein. So the genetics that you learned about affects the sequence of the DNA and the potentially the sequence of the proteins. Epigenetics affects whether the gene is on or off. Both are important. And the shocking thing is <laughs> that tiny quantities of multiple chemicals can produce these effects. Mm -hmm. Vinclozolin that uh, Michael Skinner studied is a fungicide. And I, I remember Theo Colborn, God bless his soul, she died in 2014, I guess, um, who, who really conceived of there had to be endocrine disruption before it was even named. Uh, Theo would mm -hmm. just get harping mad about vinclozolin because every berry in the supermarket was soaked in vinclozolin and she, she'd get up and she'd say, well, strawberries are the worst. Don't eat strawberries that aren't organic because they're loaded with vinclozolin and it does this to you and that to you. Uh, and my daughter just loved berries. So I was constantly on the lookout to keep them away from mm -hmm. anything but organic berries. Now, I think vinclozolin usage has gone down. I actually was checking um, on my phone. To, I, I believe that's correct, but uh, it, down, it ought, to, it ought to go completely. It's an organochlorine mm -hmm. uh, uh, fungicide. And so coming back to the story, we have hundreds of these things going on that are producing very dramatic effects that are basically rolling us, uh, winding us, down and knocking us out. Did you guys know about the Environmental Working Group and about their Dirty Dozen and Clean 15 they publish every year? So the Dirty Dozen is their list of the top 12 contaminated foods, fruits and vegetables, and the Clean 15 are the least contaminated. So Actually, I have not introduced them to, to the EWG in that regard. I have talked about it, but I think, think that's a really good thing. Strawberries I mean, are always number always one or send, two on the Dirty Dozen. Yeah, I always send uh, people when they say, well, what can I do? I send them to the environment, ewg.com. Um, all right, Bruce, thank you so much for this first the legacy lecture. Uh, it gives my pleasure. people, I know everybody's head is spinning, but that's spinning in a very healthy, positive way. And we have this lecture online. You have access to it. And I will leave it there. So you ought to be able to come back if later on, God, I really wanted to know what that guy was saying. What was his name now? Oh, yeah. What was he saying about that? You can come back and, and find it out. All right. So thank you very, very much, Bruce. And thank you for getting up My so pleasure. early. It's always a true privilege to listen to you. I you get me quite a, a little bit. I've always <laughs> learned a lot. I still have a lot to learn. And uh Thank, thank you so very much. Uh, everybody, uh, we'll call the class to an end. And uh, remember, we've got another one of these on Thursday. All right. That will be okay. Dr. Pete Myers. Bye-bye, okay. everyone. Thank you. Thank you.